him about that. How he fishes shallow water, how he finds he's out of the way. I think you got, weren't you guys out fishing today? Kind of. Eh. More like trying to pull something. everybody welcome to bash university live it is the frog days of summer here at the bash university and man oh man we were out today filming some on water and we were frog fishing and i'm so excited tonight uh we have uh, arguably the greatest frog angler that has ever lived he's won tournaments at the top level he's developed a frog with spro the bronze eye frog that that really has revolutionized the hollow belly frog uh, lure, and and he's going to be with us tonight. We've got Dean Rojas on Bash University live tonight, so stay tuned. He's going to be here in in just a few minutes, and you guys are going to be ask be able to ask him questions. All subscribers for Bash U, we're going to be giving away tons of prizes from TH Marine and and various others. A lot of Bash U swag rolling around. So I'm very excited about it. It's frog season. I was just out filming. It's post-spawn. It's summertime patterns, and they are munching on top. And uh, there's a lot to learn. I've got a lot of questions. And um, and we've got an amazing panel, as usual. As usual, We've got the whole Bash U Live crew with us tonight. I see some really cool people on the Zoom screen right now, uh, most of which don't need an introduction, but we've got the program manager, the production manager, a.k.a. professional fish head, Justin Kimmel with us tonight. How are you, J.K.? Man, I'm great. Really looking forward to this one. I love some frog fishing, as you well know. I, I sure do know. I know you're you're killing it on frogs. You're catching on your buddy tournaments. You and your partner are constantly catching some big fish and winning derbies on frogs. So uh, looking forward to getting your questions involved in the mix. And, uh, and talking with Dean about all this stuff. So it's good to have you with us, especially at the beginning of the show tonight. Yeah, thank you, man. And, and of course, we've got the Ken Cyclopedia, the keeper of the scrolls, the all-powerful, the mighty, the great <laughs> one, Mr. Ken Duke. Woo! <laughs> Thrilled to be here, guys, as always. I, you know, I'm just trying to offer some geographic balance to the show. You guys are all from Canada. I'm down here in Florida where every day is frog day. <laughs> Man, isn't that the truth? You lucky bastard. I, I, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to apologize, Pete. Come on down, brother. You got a place to stay. Man, I'm, I'm on my way. Um, that is really a cool thing about Florida is, and that's true. It's, it's a 12 month a year thing down there, isn't it? It is absolutely a 12 month a year thing down here. And uh, it is the rare day where you can't get some kind of topwater bite going. It may not be the best bite, of course, but just about every day is topwater day down here. Wow. Well, uh, looking forward. Uh, I know you're bringing some heat tonight uh, oh, with, man. with the trivia questions because they've been getting you pretty quick here on Bass U Live. That, that just means that the dean of Bass U, none other than Pete Gluzik, is doing too good a job educating this audience. So <laughs> uh, for you folks who are watching at home and checking this out, yeah, no mercy tonight. I got a really tough question for some great prizes that Brian the Carpenter and the Riz can tell you about. And, and Pete, I've got a tough question for the panel, uh, for you, for Justin, and for Dean, if he'll hang in there and give it a try. Bring in the heat, laying down the gauntlet, look forward to it. Going to be fun. Uh, and, and of course, of course. You, you already mentioned it. We got, as always, pushing the buttons. And helping us out is BTC and the Riz. How are you guys? Good, man. We're good. We're uh, ready to go, Rich. Feeling you're great. Feeling great. Ready for another awesome Bash U Live <laughs> with the greatest fans in the game. Feeling groovy. Yeah. <laughs> and we got we got to spend the day on the water today. And uh, is it because Riz was uh, was, was assistant uh, producer today as we were filming some on water pieces. And uh, had to take some notes, do some social media. Is that the hardest job in the world to be out there on the grass flats and not be able to cast or is? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> is it assistant producer or assistant to the producer? Uh, hmm. uh, well, question, Mr. Which one do you like, Riz? 
He he was very he's, helpful and appreciated. He's, he's busy handling something right now, but yeah, we'll go yeah. with assistant to the producer. <laughs> yes. And, and, <laughs> a shout out to Jeff Olson, who uh, who was back in action at the Bash University. It was great to have him with us uh, filming. Of course, uh, Jeff is responsible for all the amazing production quality that goes into Bash University TV, and it was a, it was a treat to to be together. Uh, for the first time, uh, really, since uh, we've been, you know, quarantined. So it was great to great to be with Jeff. Great to have Riz with us, and uh, and we actually got a, a a few a little frog action today, didn't we, Riz? Rich, is he, is he <laughs> he's got his, he's got out. his headphones off right now, handling something, just trying to get the message boards. All three of the message boards rolling. We're on we're on Facebook, yeah. we're on YouTube, and we're on the Bass University's website. So. Rich is just getting all his all his uh, message boards in order, so we can keep. We'll in let touch we'll with let him do his job, but I will say we're that here, we did baby. get we're live. frog action. <laughs> we're 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 on we're we're on, we're on things here. We're on things. Yeah, we're on. I was just telling stuff. the folks that we, we got a, we had a few fish that smashed some top water today, and uh, we were talking about uh, hollow belly frogs versus buzz toads, uh, and we had a nice. Um, you know, it, it was a nice piece out there where we got to learn a few things, see a few things. And uh, it was great to have Riz there with us. And and I appreciate him lending me a bunch of his rods. I think uh, the I think the MVP today was the was the uh, was the was the frog. Actually, it was it was a bite getter. It was explosive. It was exciting. That John Cruz cash and frog rod was just straight putting the work to him. Yeah, that's a meat stick. Sure is. <laughs> I tell you, every rod that that John has designed for Cashin's an excellent rod. I think I'm I think I'm just gonna get all John Cruz rods and and uh, not give it any thought these days. It's it's a great rod. Congrats and shout out to John Cruz. But I enjoyed using your frog rod today, and uh, we had a blast, guys. You're watching us over on Facebook. Turn your notifications on. You like what you're listening to from Bash University TV? Make sure you got your notifications on so when we're live, you know it. Same on YouTube. Make sure you hit that notification button. Um, hit that little bell icon, and that way you'll know when we're live. And we also, we have a, as always, we're going to have a Facebook like and share. If uh, if you're going to continue to watch us over on Facebook, like us and share us over there. And we got a prize for you guys, too. I know we're prize heavy for the subscribers of Bash University TV, as it should be, and we appreciate you guys greatly. But we're, we're always going to show some love to the folks over on Facebook, so like us and share us. And uh, we've got some great prizes for you. Riz, what, what other prizes are we giving away tonight? We got a, a big-time great Ken Duke trivia prize. I think we uh, might have touched on that briefly and how it's the hardest question we've ever rolled out. But for the <laughs> Bash U TV subscriber – the Bash U TV subscriber that gets the Ken Duke trivia question right, they're going to get bah, 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 a new Bash University official camouflage hat, Ooh. a Bash University Rod Warrior rod sleeve, a pair of Mike Iaconelli signature series sunglasses, I'm not done, Pete, a flambeau box, <laughs> a Storm Arashi glide bait, and an RTD rod threading device so that's about a hundred dollar value guys so that pays for your your membership almost right there get signed up tonight don't wait be a part of the show and get access to our over 700 videos on the bashu.tv website and become a better bass angler tonight that's right members you will earn that prize tonight <laughs> somebody will earn it the hard way <laughs> i look forward to that question and and uh subscribers you know, I know we're going to be talking about Spro Frogs tonight, but you can get 40% off Terminator Frogs as a Bash University subscriber. Uh, but we also, if 40%. you have a, Nice. Yes, sir. That's a we, Rapala uh, discount? That is the Rapala discount. Terminator is part of the Rapala family. But we, we are having a Spro. It's Frog Days of Summer, guys. You're going to get two Spro Frogs. You're going to get a Bash University hat. You're going to get a face shield and a lot of great stuff. Uh just for subscribing to Bash University TV annually, trying it out. Uh, so go check that out. You got 30 days free going on right now, too. So uh, there's no excuse. Get signed up. Check it out. It's going to help you become a better angler. That's why we do all this stuff. So um, it's great. I see the IMs. Uh, there's a lot of active people already on the IMs. And uh, it's, uh, you know, one of the guys is Black Senko. <laughs> uh, 
W. Dean Black Senko. I don't know why people always think that that's all I throw is a Black Senko. The W. <laughs> Dean 40 Black Senko, that is. <laughs> you know, Pete, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a, there's a tournament coming up on a lake that you've done well on the Black Senko. Can you guess what lake that is? <laughs> uh, that that must it's be somewhere. Coyote. It's somewhere Everything. up north. It's in yep. the states of New York and Vermont. It's it's pretty interesting. Uh, well, I, you're talking about Champlain, but the uh, it, the BFLs were really neat. What they did because uh, they're doubling up their tournaments and and they're having two two tournaments on Cayuga back to back, and two tournaments on Thousand Islands back to back to make up their schedule. Uh, man, that sounds fun. I, JK and I were talking about that, and that sounds exciting. I might want to go up to Lake Cayuga and fish for a couple of days. Well, Pete, yeah, it's actually a good opportunity to go up to uh, Lake Champlain here in a couple of weeks. Cashin is having a frog-only fishing tournament up on Lake Champlain out of Ticonderoga, and this is held by Cashin Fishing Rods. And to fish in this tournament, it's a spro-only tournament, and you got to use – a Cashin John Cruz Frog Rod or a Cashin F90474B. <laughs> so without you knowing it, Pete, I have already signed us up. We're taking the <laughs> boat up and we're fishing that tournament and we're gonna win it. So <laughs> 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 well you you would be the best partner uh to throw a frog. I know Man, after fishing with you a little bit today, you, you between that and the chatterbait, I, you can't get those two rods out of your hand. How how are you going to go fishing and not throw a chatterbait, Riz? Uh, you know, it'd be a <laughs> challenge, but I think I think throwing a frog would be about the best consolation prize I could have to throw in a chatterbait. So, yes, that, absolutely. <laughs> I love those tournaments where where guys are restricted to one bait or or one brand because you get you see some amazing ingenuity come out of that. I mean, let's say that the topwater bite is just completely dead out there, but you still got to throw a, a bronze I-65. There will be guys who will load those things with BBs. Oh, yeah. They'll pitch and flip them into mats, and they'll find a way to take that bait and catch a, 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 great, you know, a great bag of fish out of them, and I think that's really cool. Yeah, we got, we got a buddy that did that. Uh, uh, our boy Keith Cowan did that on the flats a couple years ago. It had one under the boat, and... He soaked it, filled the thing up with water, and dropped it. Got that frog to sink right in front of it and jacked him. It, in, the, in, that instance, the in that instance, when you're uh, when you're fishing those types of derbies, can you like put like a four foot leader and hang a black sanko off of a frog? Probably. <laughs> Does that still count? <laughs> An over under frog rig. Yeah, or put a vibrating <laughs> lip on the front of it. I like it. <laughs> I like it. Hey, All right, we got Dean and the uh, Q guys. Oh, oh, excellent. Well, um, are we going to take a break, Brian, or that's, are we going to bring Dean that's right the move. in? That's the move. Yeah. Guys, go over and sign up to BashU.TV. Now's the time. It's frog days of summer. We're going to be hooking you up with our guests, frogs. I'm talking about spro frogs. These are the ones that really revolutionized the frog business, and that's part of the frog days of summer package for subscribing to BashU TV annually, and we have 30 days free. No excuse. Come over, check it out, become a better angler. We're going to take a quick break. And we're going to be right back with Dean Rojas. The micro jig rod from Cashin is not only a micro jig rod, it also works great for shaky heads, also works great for wacky worms, also works great for smaller finesse style swim baits. So seven foot one inch, medium action, fast taper. You want a workhorse spinning rod, you might want to look at the micro jig rod I got one, and then I had to, had to end up getting three or four, so the Micro Jig Rod by Cashin, your next workhorse in your spinning rods. Every moment on the water not spent fishing is a moment wasted. That's why Minn Kota and Humminbird have joined forces to bring you the One Boat Network, products that communicate and integrate to help you take full command of your boat. Born from our commitment to making the most advanced fishing gear even better by making it work together, the One Boat Network will help you find, get to, stay on, and catch more fish. When One Boat Network products talk to each other, they can navigate your boat automatically. They can give you a crystal clear view of what's below with no messy wires. And they can let you lower, raise, and change shallow water anchor modes from anywhere on the boat. But that's just the beginning. 
we're never done innovating, integrating, and making your boat simpler and easier to control. All so you can make every second on the water count. Tackle Warehouse is proud to sponsor the FLW Pro Circuit and is the official tackle retailer of FLW. Providing proven bass fishing gear as well as the newest and hottest tackle. Our friendly and knowledgeable customer service staff can help you every step of the way. And we offer free ground shipping on orders over $50. Tackle Warehouse. Everything for the bass angler at the lowest prices. Guaranteed. I have to be constantly on the lookout for new techniques to stay on the top of my game. Giant. Some have been more Giant. successful oh God, than others. Giant. The finesse fingernail. It happens every time. The chain gang. Oh ah, broke it off. The crow's nest. Never let go. And don't even get me started on tackle management, especially trying to stop rust and corrosion. Peanut butter. Hmm, I could. Motor oil. Gotta keep the rust off all these baits. WD-40. Gotta keep the rust off. Silica, toothpicks, Q-tips, the list goes on and on. I'm hard on tackle, I fish fast, I need my tackle organized and protected. I can't be worrying about losing baits to rust. And when it comes to tackle management, there's only one solution. Flambo Tackle Storage Systems with Z-Rust Technology. The original anti-rust tackle box. Uncompromised clarity. Renowned durability. The infused anti-rust option that is FDA safe and free of harmful chemicals. The organization options are endless, but there's only one. One box, one anti-corrosion technology, one family-owned American-made brand, Flambo. Z-Rust Tackle Solutions. Preserve, perform, repeat. Hey everybody, welcome back to Bass University Live. We've got a great show. Uh, we're going to be talking frog fishing tonight and we really, we have a revolutionary in that part of fishing. Um, the, the greatest, developed one of the best frogs in the business, the best selling frogs uh, continually right now. And he, he's a winner. He's won huge. And I'm tickled to death to have you on Bash University, uh, the great Dean Rojas. Woo! Dean Machine. Thank you, guys. Happy to be here. Happy to be home for a little while. Being home after a three and a half week uh, stint on the road. But uh, back home in the desert where it's 110 degrees outside. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Uh, are are the the key question is are they biting frogs in 110 degree weather? Yes, they are, Pete. Especially here on Havasu, the hotter it gets, the better the frog bite. Uh, we have a lot of current, you know, in our in our system. So a lot of the backwaters, the secondary backwaters, uh, anywhere that's kind of moving water, they get it right in the shade there, and it's uh, it's great fishing right now. The hotter, the better when it comes to frogging. Man, that, well, that's 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 super hot. We had some hot frog action today uh on the upper chesapeake um and we we were having a blast the fish were the fish are post spawn they're just just kind of starting to feed again and uh and and that's what they're wanting right now and i uh you know so we've got tons of questions you know of frogs and i know our people let's talk about the chesapeake for a second the last time we were there i got flooded out is is that big flat still good and still a lot of grass because it was really good frogging out there Nah, just I, fish the northeast. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what, Dean, I've been fishing down there for, I don't know, 25 years now. And yep. it goes through ebbs and flows, right? Peaks and valleys. And we we are at a peak. I mean, the grass out on the flats is really strong. The milfoil is up. The eelgrass is up. It's, it's not quite full maturity yet. Uh, but the numbers of fish are as good as I've seen them on the Chesapeake right now and it it's frog season. Yeah. Uh-huh. That's the fun time. Yes. Yes, sir. But we, we, before we had you, uh, on, of course, on our break, of course, it's always the best part of the show, but, uh, there, there's, um, there was a, a monster event and it, and it happened 19 years ago. And I'm, 
I was just so impressed with what happened. And it was, I know it was a monster moment for you and, and a crushing humiliation moment for me. Cause I had no idea what you were doing at the time in that tournament, but you <laughs> crushed the record. Um, for a 45 pound stringer of fish. It's never been done before or since. And, and that's your record that, that, that must have been the most amazing moment ever. It was. You know, it'll be 20 years this upcoming January. I celebrate uh, January 17th every year with a toast to my uh, my mount right here with a 45 tube. Uh, and gracious enough to be able to be lucky enough to, to weigh those, catch those fish on that magical day. Um, I'll tell you a quick little story that really kind of put things in perspective for me. Even though at the time I was young, I really didn't realize a whole lot of it, but Denny Brower and I shared a sponsor uh, at that time, and uh, we had a sponsor dinner the, the night uh, of that day. And uh, I'll never forget when I pulled up the parking lot. Of course, it's Denny Brower. I'm not the second year on tour for me, so he's still like a hero and a big man, obviously. So a little intimidation, you know. And, and it was, it was, uh, it was, you know, and I was kind of, I wouldn't say embarrassed, but I was like, you know, I just got 45 pounds. What am I going to say to the, the flipping legend, you know? I mean, so – he looked at me and he, you know, he does that little smirk, you know, the stash and everything. And he goes, Come that, I said, yeah, I did. He says, uh, let me tell you something, son, that record will never be broken. Whoa. I said, I, I, said, I don't care. This is me talking 20 years ago. I said, I don't care because right now my dream and my goal in my life is to win a bass event. And if the record is the record, I don't care. Because all I want to do is I want to have a Bassmaster title. You know, I want the trophy. I want to fulfill a, a childhood dream of mine, you know, to be able to hoist the plaque in front of all those people and, and to, um, you know, have the victory. And he looked at me and he says, you don't know what, the, what you've done, do you? And I said, no, sir, I don't. I just want to win the tournament. He says, well, you're going to win the tournament all right. There ain't no doubt about it. He says, and you'll probably win five or six more events, even more, you know, whatever. He says, but you will always be noted for that record. That record will be your your foundation of your career for the rest, uh, as long as you want to be a professional bass fisherman. And, uh, you know, being young back then, a little bit older now, a little wiser, uh, now I understand what he was talking about. And people love to talk about the record. I enjoy telling the story. Um, it takes me about an hour and 20 minutes to tell the whole story on how it all went. <laughs> <laughs> you no, know, uh, I, uh, I, I tell about, you know, personally where I was at at that time. And, and I watched each one of them bite my white lizard and, you know, all those things that happened that day. And I, and it's burned in my memory and I, I enjoy it. Um, and so I, I uh, it's just a special time. It's awesome. And well, that, that was great. Uh, congratulations. And Denny, was a prophet because he was right. Uh, it has stood, it has stood the test of time. Yeah. yeah. And I remember I I remember being in that event and I I remember watching it. Well, let me tell you this because it was it was crazy for me because I was fishing offshore during that tournament and we had been to Toho previously in a couple Bassmaster tournaments and and 10, 10 12 pounds a day would get you high in the money, give you a shot to win that tournament. And all, I was fishing offshore, and I was catching twice that, like 15, 17, 20 pounds. Um, and I thought, man, I, you know, I'm going to take a run at this tournament. So much so that I came to the to the weigh-in with like 15, 16 pounds, something like that. Hmm. And I thought, this is a great start for me. You know, I, I'm going to – a couple more days of this, I'm going to be right there. <laughs> and, and so – <laughs> I was, I, I like arrogantly asked like one of the guys, I don't even remember who it was that was idling out of the Marina. The oh, tow what's leading it? I said, what's leading it? And, so, and somebody said 45 pounds. And I'm like, yeah, that's, yeah, that, that's ridiculous. So I asked like five more people <laughs> no. and, and they said, yeah, 45 pounds. Then there's another 40. There's 30, 30, 30, 30, 30. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god did you let your fish go and drive home <laughs> put it right on the trailer you oh know my god i just don't want to you don't want to put your 15 pounds in the live release boat because dean's fish could eat them 
<laughs> it, it even it, more weight, you know. Did you, did you lay off of them that day? Did you did you get your oh. team lay off them? I I, I promise you, you I laid practicing. off my fish. I, I, I did. I I uh, after I caught well, I caught the ten twelve first, and then oh my god, I, uh, uh, that's a whole story in itself because that's the meanest bass I ever encountered in my whole career as being a professional angler. Uh, but the second one I caught was the uh, two and a half, a four pounder. And then I caught a nine pounder <laughs> in my bed. And um, then I ended up catching a two and a half. And I, I left that area with, with four bass. And uh, of course, remember uh, Pete, uh, they had a lot of fog back then. And once it all cleared on that, on that day, it really got flat and no wind at all, just perfect sight fishing conditions. And, you know, I ended up, I ended up rolling up on a point and, uh, and I ended up catching them 10 pounder doing that the same thing. That's a whole story. I just, dude, you guys, we'll be here for like two hours to get started on this, all right? Because each of it own own story to it. But um, at that time, when I when I caught my lemon, I, I had two tens, a nine, a four, and a two and a half. I, I just sat there in, in amazement, knowing that I had well over 30 pounds in the boat. And uh, and I just sat there and I go, man, do you, do you stop or do you, stop, do you save these or? What do you do? And and I remember, you know, a quote from Rick Plunn a long time ago, it's just like, live, live at the moment, you know, at that time. And the things are happening, you need to roll with it. And so for me, and my, at the time we had, we had co-anglers, and, and he was so immersed in what I was doing, he just stopped fishing. He goes, man, he goes, you've got five now? He goes, let's go find another lady. Find another big one. He said, just roll with it, man. And, he, and uh, I just went down another, I don't know, 150 feet and caught up. About an eight twelve, and then, then I went down on the water, a seven ten. So it, it was like you know, it was just it was meant to happen. And at one thirty, I had all my weights, you know. And back then, Pete, you remember it was one hundred and fifty guys. Mm-hmm. It wasn't like it was now, where it was eighty or a hundred. You know, I mean, it was a full field of one hundred and fifty guys on Toho, you know, and Hatchnah Hall and Cypress and Kissimmee, all that. So a uh, big field back then. And I just remember idling in because I knew my life was going to change. And, and every time I, I would count the weights in my rival, I would go, that's not, that's not possible. There's no way. <laughs> wow. That, that's, that's truly amazing. And I remember, I remember the video of, um, of you. I remember the one sticks in my head where you threw your rod in the water or, you know, you just didn't care. You just bat, you just got another 10 pound class fish. Uh, the elation must have been spectacular. It's, it's still, I can see it on your face even now. It's uh, when I start talking about it, I get, I live all the emotions of that day. Uh, and I relive a lot of it. And it's, uh, it was a special time. Um, when I caught that big one, that was the second day of competition. I didn't have a camera boat on me on the first day, but the rod falling over it, it ain't going to go anywhere. It's only three and a half feet deep. Right there, so <laughs> I still have a lot attached to the fish, so <laughs> but it was <laughs> part of the moment, you know, and just uh, just incredible. It's un- unforgettable, and I I remember watching you because I was fishing within vicinity of you because I was fishing offshore. And I remember thinking, that nope, Dean, they're not up yet. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Look at this guy Whoa. over there. <laughs> <Look at this guy. laughs> but we are we are here for Bash University uh, subscribers. And, Rich, I know we got a lot of people in the queue, and I see you texting me. Why don't we fire a couple uh, questions from the Bash University subscribers for Dean? For sure. Well, a- as everybody knows, Dean, you are you are very well known for your frog fishing techniques and your skill level at uh, at frog fishing. And so obviously our message board is lit up with people wanting to know about your frog and techniques. So uh, the first question is going to come in from Anthony Darren, and he wants you to um, he wants you to solve a little bit of a, a myth amongst fishing. Does does trimming the legs uh, on your frog? at uneven lengths does that help you walk it and if so do you trim your your frog legs at uneven lengths that's a great question uh it's one i get asked quite often um when we first designed the frog we we had you know longer legs on the bait itself i don't have any here um but they they would they would come down to about right here Uh, okay so they would about be an inch and a half long uh and a lot of people like to chug it and the, the, the key about it is the longer the legs, the more drag the bait is. 
okay? The shorter the legs, the more it frees up the back end of the crawl, all right? So your question on trimming the legs, whether they're even or uneven, is, is something that you can do. I mean, it'll free up the back of the frog. It doesn't matter which one you get. It's the Spit Shad, the King Daddy, the Pop Frog, whatever, whatever spro frog it is. You trim the legs in the back, it starts to free the bait up. But if you still like that frog profile, the legs uh, and, and the, the overall look of the bait, that's what you want. Okay? You want something that's going to be uniform. For a length that I like, it's very easy to – so look at that in the sense of where I get the most action uh, of, of the bait and I still have the legs that are hanging down in, in the water. So I just, I just roll the legs back and they stop right there at the line top. Okay. See that? I don't know if you can see that right there, but yeah. okay. That is a good gauge to start with. Okay. If you want to, if you want more action on the back of the frog, you want to walk it more, you can trim them back even further than that. Uh, if you like to chug it or you like to just, you know, sashay it back and forth like you would a zero scoop, then, then you can do that. But this is like the best uh, all-around length that will allow you to do all those certain things that you want to do with the bait. Um, same thing on the popping frog. Same same deal on that as well. You know, the, the length of the legs go right up to the cup. Uh, but if you if you want to cut one shorter than the other, Hey, whatever you want to do. I mean, it's your frog, and if you feel like it's going to get more bites for you, then go ahead and do it. I mean, if it, if, it, if it acts differently, I've done them both ways. I'm just comfortable with the way that I do it um, because I've been doing it for, you know, 15 years now. So it, it works well for me. And I, I noticed that with Ryu Riz today. You handed me a couple frogs with the legs uh, trimmed different lengths. Right, right. I, I mean, a lot of times uh, when I'm throwing a frog, it's – you know, it's either tight to cover or if we're out on the grass flat, it's, you know, bombing it out there and, and walking it back. But I've, I've found for me that if I trim them shorter, like you were saying, Dean, there's less drag and it frees up the back of the frog. It seems like that makes it easier to walk to walk the frog if there's if there's less dragging behind. That's correct. Yes, absolutely. Dean, you you designed this frog what, 15 years ago. Um, yeah. This is right after the 2004 Bassmasters Classic, um, uh, Pete, uh, on Wiley. When I was, when I, when it was a magical time back then because, you know, ESPN just bought Bass and it was, a, it was a lot of hype and big venue, lots of people, you know, just, I mean, just an, a great time. A lot of exposure in our sports uh, with, with all the other shows that were surrounding it at that time. And so uh, it was a perfect time for the, the a bait like this that the way I fished it was so untraditionary compared to what you think frog fishing is. And at the time, I was throwing a sumo frog, and I almost won that classic. That's one top hero one. Uh, but the bait was heavily flawed. And so after that, that event, um, Spur at the time, and I was already talking to them prior to the classic, um, they wanted me to design my own. And, and, I, and I wanted to design my own because I knew I could make it better than anything that was out there. And I'm not sitting here telling you I'm the one who created it all because I'm not. I, I made it. I made it better uh, than what was already out there with the components, the hook, the material that we use in the bait, and more importantly, the hookup ratio was was my number one important thing uh, on the bait because I wanted to spell the myth that frog fishing was a low hookup ratio, and I wanted it to be a high hookup ratio that a dad could take his son fishing in a pond. You know, and, and catch a couple bass or go on a local lake or a river and the bait would not get hung up if you threw it in the tree. But if a bass ate it, you could catch them on. And those were the things that really fueled me into designing the bait as perfect as I can possibly make it to where you will, the highest hookup ratio that you can get is with a scroll bronze eye frog. Now there are alterations you can do to it. You can open up the legs, the hooks, or you know, to get it away from the body that if you're fishing more open water, or sparse vegetation, or just little pockets of little gra of grass, great for open those hooks up because then you increase your hookup ratio even more uh, at that without the without getting hung up in the moss. So little tricks you can do, um, but for me, it's all about placement. I'm not big on throwing across big mats, you know, and sitting there working it across the whole carpet, the whole deal. You know, it just takes forever. 
I'm more of a target guy. If I see a bush laying in the water or I see a dog piling or um, a seawall or a little patch of grass here or there, I want to throw the bait right to that. And, and I cover water uh, much like a guy throwing a spinnerbait would, you know, or flipping a kitchen where you're just covering water. I'm hitting the percentage spots while I'm fishing. So this frog is designed to do that and to fish over mats if that's what you have uh, on your local water. Well, that's certainly what we have here. And, um, and I'll get to you next, Ken. Um, you know, we have the mats, but I, I remember that when, when I saw the video of you, I'm like, what? he's skipping a frog under there? Like, that's just, man, that, that, that blew my hair back. I'm like, man, that's, that's amazing. And, you know, winning the tournaments are doing really well, throwing it in places where the rest of us weren't. And that was the key. And I learned that here in Lake Havasu. And it was all, it, it was first, it was just a joke. It started off to be a joke on, you know, seeing how far you could, we had, we had snag proofs, okay, at that time. You know, they're better now, but back then, there, there was nothing like what we had now on the market. And so we, we would just skip it back there just to see if we'd get a bite, you know, and see how far you could get it back there. So it was almost like a game. And then after about the third or fourth four pounder that just crushed it, because you could never get it back in there, you know, it's just, it doesn't get, the bait doesn't get hung up. So you can cast it wherever you want. And it really opened up those areas that were not conducive for traditional type bass rollers. So for me, it was a technique that I had that I brought onto the tour that I had an advantage with. And there was a lot of times I came in behind people and just clean, cleaned up because they, they weren't fishing. I was fishing a totally different way in a different presentation. And uh, of course, you know, it, it was a skipping, you know, and, getting it way back underneath the cover and those shade dark pockets. And, um, you know, now it's just a staple now on the tour. Yeah. You've definitely changed things. Ken, go ahead. I was going to say, Pete, to borrow one of your phrases, and I mentioned earlier, I've been lucky enough to have been in a boat with Dean, and 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 he blew my hair back, to borrow your phrase, <laughs> in a big way, because Dean can put one of those bronze eyes or popping frogs in a place that a, that a real frog cannot go. And, <laughs> and Dean, I was wondering – how much of that, that that's got to be so critical. And the average guy, he doesn't get enough time on the water or he doesn't practice enough. He doesn't do the things to be able to do that. How critical is that to your, to the way you fish a frog, to be able to put it in those places where they're not seeing another bait? Well, it's absolutely critical, especially at, at my level of fishing, uh, at the top tier level. I mean, you're fishing against the hundred best guys in the world and they can do it all. And they've all proven that they, they can do it all. And so any kind of time you can have an advantage of like that and to be able to apply it during an event, uh, obviously it's going to help you in the standings. You're going to catch a lot more fish. Uh, now, I've learned it. to skip a frog, but not not super well. Any tips for, for guys who uh, are looking to take their skipping game up a notch? Well, there's it's a, it's a combination of things, Ken. It's a great question. Because you have to have the right rod, um, and you have to have the right uh, casting motion, and you can't be afraid of backlash. Okay, so many people are, especially big casters, they they, um, they think a backlash is just you know the worst thing ever because they'll blow up a reel. Um, you know, we're fortunate enough to do it every day, so our our movements with our hands and with our thumbs, um, we just do it. We don't even think about it. Um, and when I do think about it, Ken, when I see a spot and I go, I want to hit that. And, I, and the more I think about it, the worse my count. You know what I mean? <laughs> not exactly what you mean. Whatever. You know what I mean? It's, I, I'm, I'm a person that I, if I see a glance, I see what, what, what I want, I just go do it. And then I'll, and I'll put it right where I need to. If I have to sit and think about it, like I'm waiting for it, I'll mess the cast up. I mean, it's, it's a mess. That's so well, your, your instincts are razor sharp because I've seen them at play, but I know what you mean when, when you're trying to teach somebody and you're saying, see that spot way under that dock, and then you try to do it, you're, you're more apt to overthink it. But uh, how about adjusting the reel? How about uh, uh, the level of line on the spool? Do you recommend anything special for a guy really getting started out on skipping? Well, I'll give you the setup right now, and uh, it's a setup that I use – I uh, designed the, the frog rod for duck fishing. It's my Dean Rojas frog and rod. I have a 7-1 and a 7-2 action. And the beauty of those rods is 70, 80% of it is just meat, okay? It's, it's really stiff, but super light. 
Uh, but the, the 20% of the raw, the tip is really limber. Two things for that, that why it's so limber is because number one, for casting purposes, if you thought, think about a shock on a car or a truck as it's going over the bumps, the rod is doing the same exact thing when you're skipping. Every time that bait hits, that rod, and you can't see it because it happens so fast, but every time that rod, that, that bait hits the water, that soft rod absorbs the tip. That's why you can't skip with it. You cannot skip with a stiff rod because the, you, Great the, point. It'll, it'll stop it and you'll backlash. The rod has to help the frog skip across the water. Okay, That's the first one. The second thing is you got to be able to work the, the, the bait itself. That fast tip, you're able to apply action to where you're, you're shaking the slack. Okay? You're not pulling on the frog. You're shaking the slack, which is causing the bait to walk back and forth. So it's, it's, it's in something that comes with practice on that. I use a high-speed reel. I use a 7 to 3. Sometimes I use an 8.3. Uh, Duck it makes a great paradigm reel that works well for that. I don't use any drag at all. I lock it down all the way. <laughs> I don't want nothing. As soon as that fish hits, I want instant, you know, hook set. And so I, I want no give. I want to have control of that fish the minute that he bites that lure and I set the hook on him. I use eight pound Sunline FX2 braid. It's a it's 80. a wow. It has the same diameter as 65, but it breaks at 80. So it's it's a it's a and I've been I've been to Sunline I've been to Japan I watched them how they make it and it's incredible the process of how that comes together and so with that I know I have the strength that it's not going to break and I know the frog has great quality components in it and between the rod loading up the good hook set the real lockdown on like a winch and braid that's not going to stretch I can get control of the fish very very quickly and. And, get, and a lot of times they run to you, and that's the reason for the high-speed reel. Uh, and then obviously for multiple casts throughout the day, I can be very quickly on getting the bait in and firing back out there again. I'm sorry to, to hijack the program here, but I did have another question. You kind of brought it up because you talked about the hook set, Dean. And, and I know that you have a theory, and I think it's dead on the money in my personal experience and from talking to a lot of other top anglers about when you set the hook after you get a bite on a frog. And I was hoping you could share that with us. Yeah, that's like the million dollar question, Ken. It's, uh, you know, it, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of a guessing game, um, but you have to really read the fish and, and how they're, they're, they're attacking the bait. Uh, there are many times where they just come up and they just, they just never get it. They'll punt it. They'll punt it out of the water <laughs> in their mouth. Uh, they'll swipe at it. And, or they'll just completely miss it. You know? It's not the frog's fault. They never got it, you know. But a lot of times, you know, you set the hook and the frog comes flying back. And um, But I'm the kind of guy that I'm watching the bait. And, I, and maybe it's because I've seen it so many thousands of times that when I see them get it, I, I know they got it. And I'm not saying it's perfect, but I hit them. As soon as I see the splash, I hit them. I hit them as hard as I can. And, and uh, do I miss them? Uh, sometimes always throw back in there again. So it's not like, you know, the chance is lost. You have an opportunity to, uh, to throw back in there again. So um, I like to hit him as soon as I see the explosion, unless I still see my frog sitting there, you know, or he just missed it. I'll let it sit there. So, um, but if I miss one, okay, reel the frog back in, fire back in there again. Now I'm in that area. I slow it down. I walk it to the left, let it sit there, walk it to the right. I want to give every opportunity for that bass to take another shot at that thing. Um, and uh, not to say it happens all the time, but it's, you know, it's a percentage that will be better if you just didn't cast in there at all or just, you know, not, not fish slow. Do you, do so, you uh, opt for ever a, a follow-up bait as opposed to putting the frog back in there? Uh, you know, that's a, that's a good question, Pete. A lot of times, um, I can tell by the splash, you know, how big it is and, uh, and what it's doing. It, it all depends on the situation that I'm in. If, if I'm, I'm hurting for a bite, hurting for a fish, then I'll slow down if I feel like it was right. But if not, I keep trucking. I keep moving. Because we, we have multiple day events, and, you know, if, if he missed it or didn't get it, you know, and I feel like it wasn't worth it, um, you know, I can always come back the next day. Because those bass, you know, they hang around, and 
you know, there's something that, that triggered him to, to go after it, you know, and maybe the next time I come around, I'll be in a better mood to take the whole thing. You know? <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, guys, watching us over on uh, Facebook, I want you to like and share us over there. And we got a great prize pack worth, what is it, like $10,000? Uh, yeah, it, it, it at least it's uh it's actually a Minn Kota hat, a Tackle Warehouse hat, a Bash University hat, and a Bash University official T-shirt. Uh, outstanding! So like us and share us over there. But I want to give back yes, to if some you of have our three heads. You can win that prize. <laughs> <laughs> we're all three at the same time. That's right. I, I want to get some Bash U subscriber questions in. Riz, who do you have in the queue? Uh, the next question is going to come from Sean Boyle and Sean Boyle wants to know, Dean, uh, what, what kind of conditions are you switching from a walking frog to a popping frog? That's a, that's a good question. And it's, uh, it's, it's not like weather conditions. It's more like the, the cover that I'm fishing in that, um, I like to throw the, I mean, popping frog is a great frog and it is, it is probably, as good a seller as our original bronze eye. And the popping frog is very easy to, uh, to, to, to work. Uh, a novice can fish it because it's basically just a, you know, um, a cup bait that has a lot of action to it and you just can pull it and, you know, bite it. But I like a popping frog, especially when um, I'm fishing like over hydrilla or milfoil where there's a, a, a section of water that's, you know, just an inch, inch and a half. Um, and, and draw those fish out of the grass and out of the cover. Uh, with the bronze eye, it's it, the bronze eye. The way it works, uh, the regular sixty-five, it's it walks very uh, elegantly. It's it's just kind of just you know it kind of makes its way through there. The, the popping frog makes a lot more noise, so it draws the fish out of the cover. Because a lot of fish I catch on the bronze eye are ones that are coming from a distance. They see it and they want they want to get it. Uh, I use the popping frog to draw draw them uh, out, you know out of the cover um, with that. So um, for years, you know, it was either one or the other. And so I talked with Spro about uh, four years ago, and I said, "Man, I like to make a hybrid." And they go, "We talking about a hybrid?" I said, "I want to make a cross between our regular bronze eye and our popping frog." So we created the stitch shed, and you can see that one. It it it, it gives both of a walking motion of the popping frog, but also has the size and the and the on the bottom for a walking bait. So this bait here is is different in a way because the legs in the back are completely together. To straight. Your left, so yep, right yep, yep. So you see those are straight. They're not they're not nubbed out to the side. So what this acts is a more of a swinging motion which allows the bait to walk in place. And uh, you can do that very easily with this. This is becoming my favorite frog to throw because it's a hybrid between a popper because it sticks, it makes the commotion, and it also walks back and forth and does it just like the bronze on. So I love this thing. Uh, I won the uh, uh, Major League Fishing event at Smith Lake. Uh, I, caught a, I caught some key fish there late in the day uh, with it on that final round. And it was perfect. I mean, it was, I, and I, I felt like the popping frog wouldn't draw them up and I would get hung in the grass. And I felt like the bronze eye wouldn't, wouldn't draw them out of the grass. So I had a, a great, um, I had a great afternoon with this bait right here. The thing about the popping frog too, it's, it's very difficult to walk when you skip it under trees or limbs or tulies or reeds. It's very difficult to walk back out of there because the cup wants to grab it. Whereas you want something with a narrow, a narrow front like you have with a bronze eye. And even here, there's a release point on the bottom here. So if something gets hung, it just, it, it, you know, it slides on, on bottom. So it allows the bait to meander through the cover a lot easier instead of, you know, hitting these blunt objects and getting hung up. Can, can we expect to see a uh, Dean Rojas uh, buzz toad coming, um, you know? What, what, what do you have going on in that arena, and where does it fit into your frog fishing? Well, we're always, we're always looking at, uh, at new things and trying, uh, you, know, you know, all that. And, and the buzz frog, we're, we're looking at it. The, the, we're trying to figure out a, a perfect scenario where we don't lose the legs on those things. It's, uh, it, it's a, a, you know, there's some baits out there on the market that, that have that kind of action. Um, and the problem with those baits is that the hookup ratio is, is really poor uh, because – uh, of the way the body is designed, 
Uh, it's designed to go through there. You'd almost have to allow it to wait. You know, it's not like when you have a single hook on like a horny toe type of thing where they grab it and you got it and it's, it's all it's, it's good. With this thing, it's a lot different than that. You have a lot of fish sideswipe it, hit it, and so it, it, it's a whole different animal. And trying to figure out the right tail action in the back. And we have we have lots of prototypes. We're just trying to figure out what's going to be the best route for us to go to still have our high hookup ratio, you know, and to where, we, you know, the guys aren't losing fish on it. Because the worst thing you can have is a bait like that and you lose all the fish on it. And they're going, oh, it's a piece of junk. You know, it doesn't work. I can't hook anything on it, you know. And mm -hmm. then they have a negative experience with the bait and they don't ever want to buy another one again. So we want to make sure we do food when spro when we come out with one that it's going to be the right one uh, to where it has the, the quality uh, that we want and the hookup ratio. Cool. And Dana, I got a question. Um, you know, back in the you know the mid two thousands when you know fifteen years ago when this frog came out, it seemed like uh, everywhere you guys went that Dean got a top ten and he got a lot of them. Uh, everybody would be doing something else, but then it would be like, let's see if Dean's going to pull this off with the frog and. We know that you eventually did that, but you'd go all over the country. You know, I, I could probably come come away with 10 events that, and I was a huge fan of it and, and, and I loved it, but what it taught us, the lessons that it taught us, not only was you're putting this thing in places, um, but you're mimicking more than just frogs, you know, and you were mimicking shad and, and, and bluegill and that, those lessons, you know, were brought to us you know, through those tournaments and, and those high finishes and when we started, the wheels started turning. What I want to ask you is outside of the, the frogs and maybe shad and bluegill, did you ever get on a pattern where you were mimicking something weird off the wall with a frog and you were just that dialed into it and a frog had the ability to, to pull it off? That's a great question. And, uh, you know, there was a time, I'm a lot better now about it, but back then, uh, there was a lot of heartache and a lot of uh, love-hate relationship with, with this guy right here, okay? I mean, because I could be leaving the last, going in the last day, you know, and uh, it leave me. I mean, it's a vibe would just go away. I, I, if, if, it, if they were three-day events, I, I would probably have four or five more events uh, to my win column. Uh, That's fair. Always been uh, that last day kills me. And, and a lot of it is just... Uh, you know, the boat traffic, they want to, at that time, people were so curious on it all, you know, and I didn't, I mean, it, it was challenging having all those boats following me, but as you know, every time I left, there was just not constantly boat weights uh, where I'm throwing, you know, in, in two feet of water. So it, it made it very challenging on that. And so um, I'm a lot better, but there was a few things where I left a piece of me on that lake because <laughs> it was not good <laughs> because I was, I was not happy uh, because it just died. And, and, and that's, that's frog fishing. And I had to go through all that, all that hurt because I was trying to find the limitations of the bait. And, and what you had talked about, were you emulating a frog, a bird, a mouse, or whatever it might be? I was, I wanted to know every single thing about this bait. And I wanted to know what, what were, it was a good time to throw it, when was a bad time to throw it, and, and to learn it and go the distance with it all the way. And I did. So now, you know, I use it a lot differently than I do than I did back then. But for people thinking that it's, it's a frog, I think it. A lot of it, 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 it's. I don't think they think it's a frog on the surface. Okay, I think for us, it's it's easier to recognize it as a frog. Okay, the itself, you know, and I remember the Wiley Classic. It was rolling mud. You know, I I don't. I think more so it was a. It thought it was a bluegill. And there are a lot of times where you fish bluegill beds with a popping frog, you know, and it, it, I mean, it's, it's a redder color, you know, it's, it's the color that looks like a bluegill and, and you're catching them on. So do I think, I think it's a frog? No, I think it's just the action that the bait emulates on the water that triggers them to bite it. Uh, and the fact that you're able to put it in places that you can't put a traditional lure and it floats, uh, I think it, it adds to that. And, uh, I don't, they're just predators. They'll eat anything, you know, it's, you can throw a burrito out there sometimes and get a bite. You know? <laughs> <laughs> it's a predator sometimes. So, you know, but, but, but for us as humans looking at something, it's easiest for us to say, Hey, you know, the frog bite, you know, it's great. It's fun to talk about and it's fun to watch the bait walk across the surface. But I think at times 
they're just they're just eating whatever it is up there. They're just grabbing it because they they feel it. You know, they're lateral line. They they know something's injured up there, and they just they gotta go ahead and take it. Mm. You've uh, you've been a, a shallow water guy forever, and I I remember this story about you that I, I wanted to ask because I I never had a chance to ask you, but uh, I was talking to Ish, and Ish told me that that um, that you made your first classic, and you never had a, a depth finder on the front of your boat uh, the whole season. Is is that true? Yeah, you know, Ish is Ish is one of my best friends, and and. Uh, we came out on tour together. We traveled together for a lot of years and just a great guy, just a good friend uh, for me. Um, out here, we had the invitationals. Um, you know, I was poor. I had no money, you know. And so the boat that I had, you know, back then, you think electronics, they like they are today. They were nothing like that back then. And so uh, I I just had a flasher in the front. And, and granted, you got to understand the, the type of water we fished. You know, the Columbia River up in Pasco, Washington is clear water. You can see down 10, 15 feet. Lake Havasu, 10, 15 feet, 20 feet. Clear Lake, you can see down 10 feet. I mean, there, I mean, there's there's a lot of places where you really didn't need, you know, a graph. And uh, outside of fishing for spotted bass up there at Lake Shasta or, or uh, uh, Oroville or, uh, you know, any of those up there, you know, for me, it was just rolling up on a point and casting to the – to 40 feet of water off a point because you know they're going to be there. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't have to keep them on my graph because I, I was casting out there. And if they were there, they were going to buy it. So, you know, it, I, the stuff that we use now, you know, you can, you can see, you can see <laughs> great. But back then, I didn't have the money, you know, and I didn't have anything. I was just trying to make it. And, and uh, through the three invitationals that I fished, that I qualified, I'm sorry, four we had. Um, the, I qualified for the you know the, the top one fifties and that was just with a flasher. And because I just I grew up that's how I fished. I grew up in San Diego fishing deep. So I, I could do it with light line, with six and eight pound line. I was brought up that way. But at heart, I'm a shallow water guy. I, I love love seeing the cover and I love approaching it and I love applying the lure and giving the, the bait life, you know, and and, uh, and getting the bite. Well, and now that uh, Spro pays you eight dollars a frog, you you can get nice sonar up front. <laughs> <laughs> well, not that much, Pete, but that's a good number. I like that number, but they they wouldn't like it very much. But um, you know, they've been gracious and, and they've been a wonderful partner, and, and uh, we, yeah, we we go way back and uh, designing it. And you know, Kintaro, uh, who just retired just a year ago. Uh, had the foresight uh, to allow me to, you know, give me free reign on designing it. He says, I want you to design the best. He says, we'll use every resource that we have throughout the world. He goes, just build me the best frog uh, out there. And I said, I will. And, uh, you know, and, I, and now we have, you know, five different ones. We've got them all the way up, you know, from, uh, from the King Daddy. This is our double, double six on. I mean, that's a monster. I love it. It's a big one. But uh, you know, you catch two two and a half pounders on, you catch five pounders on. But that's a double six off there. Uh, so it's the king, king dead. There's there's nothing bigger or badder than that dude right there. Uh, all the way down to our small little, you know, popping frog that has a little two on it that we, you know, weighs you know a quarter of an ounce. I mean, it's just it's just super light. And, and for those people that want to fish in ponds and so forth, so we've tried to fulfill the whole line in creating baits that. Uh, a novice can use uh, a weekend angler can fish and talk to your pros. And so we build baits for the masses so people can have a positive experience with the with our squirrel baits. And, and we talk about how we market them and how we, we want to make them better and how we can keep pushing the envelope and, and you know, creating new, new products. And, uh, you know, to, to be with a company like that, that, that already has a great base with their government uh, you know, and their, their work ethic to, perfection and using the great quality of, of products uh you, you make great stuff and and, and it, it showed its its test of time for 15 years it's still the number one frog we've, we've sold over three million of them uh in this, that time i mean it, it's incredible world uh where this the state is gone that's amazing ken quick do the math on that eight dollars times three million <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it means Dean is picking up the tab when we go to dinner is what that means. Uh, Dean, we'll put in we'll put in a good word with uh Kazu and Sid Reeves for you to make sure you get the eight bucks. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
I want to throw it over to Riz. I know we've got a lot more questions, uh, and I and I just wanted to answer a question that I think you were probably going to ask Riz. A flasher is a device that you <laughs> used to measure depth in the front of your boat back in the day. <laughs> Believe it or not, Pete, my boat's so old it still has a flasher. But uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll move on from that. Uh, great question here from Matt Henry, and Matt Henry wants to know. Dean, what is your favorite modification to make to a frog to get more bites when you're dealing with pressured fish? Oh, that's a good question. I think for me, uh, the modification, uh, I would I would bend the hooks out even more because I want to make sure when I got that bite, I would, I would not. Uh, but secondly, I think being more precise on my presentations and getting them in, in the specific areas that those fish haven't seen a bait and, and, you know, you know, if you're just fishing a little jackpot tournament, little you know, Wednesday night or Thursday night or whatever it might, it might be, you know, you only need three bites or four bites, whatever, you know, whatever your limit is. I mean, you know, go for it, man. I mean, that's, you know, but if you're fishing a, a long event and everything and, and learning how to manage your fish, that, that's a whole animal in itself. Uh, but for me, I think the more precise presentation, slow the bait down and get, an opportunity, every opportunity to, uh, to to take the bait. Riz, keep keep coming. Let's uh, let's let's give Dean some more IMs from uh, from Bass University. The the baby's daddy wants to know, Dean, do you buy into trailer hooks on hollow belly frogs? Baby's daddy, huh? Woo. Yeah. Uh, do I about trailer hooks on frogs? And um, you know, it, it it doesn't suit my style of frog fishing. Um, but there is a place for that if, if you're fishing open water uh, or places where you're not skipping, uh, where you're just casting the bait. Uh, those those can can be uh, a great tool to use, but it won't hold up to what I'm doing. I'll get hung up every time. I'll be underneath docks and trees trying to get my bait hung off the limbs and everything. So it, it wouldn't work good for me. Um, plus, it's it, it adds appendages to the back of the bait and weight. Uh, so it, 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 it hurts the action of the bait, it kills it. Uh, you got increased drag back there with those two hooks and uh, the overall weight. Uh, because our bronze eyes, I mean, they, they're balanced. You know, they're balanced to sit at a certain level to where you're able to walk them back and forth very easy. You start weighting that down, next thing you know, the frog is sitting upwards like this, uh, and it's very difficult to make it action unless you want to chug it along. So. Um, you know, you can go ahead and do whatever you want with it. If it works for you, if you're fishing open water and, and it works for you. But for me, it just, it, it's not because I'm always fishing against the best guys in the world, it seems like. So I have to be able to be real precise with my presentations and, and, and get to get the buy. So I'm not usually calls for putting the bait where I, I can't even see where it's going to go. Um, you know, so I, I, I can't have it get from me. Great, great questions coming from the IM board. And prior to you coming on, you guys were talking about something. I wanted to revisit it. Ken, you you were talking about buckshot. I was talking about buckshot because a lot of people don't know the story about buckshot, but buckshot is a constant companion of Dean Rojas. And, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to uh, Mr. Rojas. Well, uh, buckshot, uh, he is uh, – He's well known for the people that are in the know. And um, I carry him uh, every year. I, I, I took him out one year and I uh, had the worst year of my career. And he went back in the boat with me after that. But Buckshot is a duck decoy that I found when I broke the record down in Florida. Uh, kind of a, just a, a momentum, you know, just kind of something. And uh, I, put, I threw him in the boat. I thought it was cool, you know, and it was just a regular duck decoy. The reason why his name is Buckshot is because he's got holes in the side where he's been hit a few times. Uh, <laughs> Buckshot. So, so he uh, he immediately got put in the boat and he lives in the back where my batteries are at. Uh, and I ended up breaking the record, um, you know, with him. And then the very next month after that, we went to Toledo Bend uh, for another top 150. And I won that one too. So Buckshot was with me on that. And uh, Buckshot was with me up until I think 2004, 2000, right before the class. So two, 2003, I had the worst year of my career. And for some reason, I just took him out. Uh, I just like, yeah, you know, because I was doing really well in, in 01, 02, 
roll them. I'm like, oh, you know, I don't really need them. Well, I had the worst year of my life. I left them home. <laughs> and, uh, and I remember when I got home, I looked at them, you know, sitting there on, on the shelf, and I went, you idiot. Put them back in the boat, you know. <laughs> like, just don't mess <laughs> So he's been with me ever since he goes to all, all my boats and uh, all the service crews that work on uh, when I need maintenance and need to work down the back back there. They all they all know about shot. They all see him down there. Uh, so they, it's just a running uh, little thing, and everybody asks about him, see how he's doing. And he just sits back there. And he, he, that that duck has, I mean, all the, the I'm traveling across the country and all of the the big water that I've been in and all the nasty conditions and all the great days. I mean that dog that 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 thing has got probably three hundred fifty thousand miles under him, you know, of, of highway travel and boat travel and just you know rough boat rides and glassy boat rides. I mean everything. He's been with me the whole way, and and, uh, and he sits in my my Blazer six fifty uh, right now, just sitting there back there waiting for the next turn. Well, there you have it, guys. I mean, not only does Dean have the iconic record in the sport with forty five two on a five fish limit. But he's also got the iconic good luck charm, which is inextricably tied to that catch. So, uh, how do you beat forty-five two in buckshot? All right, guys, Here we go. I'm gonna take you for a tour. Is that all right? You want to see the, the shop right there? I want. I want to see. I was going to ask you to do that. I'm glad you gl- right. glad you can. Look at that day. That's uh, that's the that's the forty-five two. Wow. <laughs> how about good that? lord. By the way, BASS has that same uh, mount display in their offices. Yep, there's there's of these made. Uh, one was uh, one of my old sponsors, and then Bass has one, and I have one. There's my uh, hundred pound bill for uh, hundred pound mark on that one, and I have the second one where I I, I did that Santee. But Ken, a little bit of trivia: those are my waist lifts. Remember back in the day? Oh yeah. Oh, yeah, film. that is so cool, Dean. It had Great to, way to display them. They had to write them down. And so the top left has the weights of the 45-2, the individual weights when they weighed them individually. I assume that there are laser beams all around it. So if someone tries to touch it or remove it, they'll be killed immediately. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, uh, it's funny. It's funny. I, I have my 15-pound weight slip, but I, I don't have a frame. <laughs> 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 and then got a couple of um, you know from some of my heroes here Bill Dance you can see that we love Bill Dance absolutely yeah, autograph to Dean yes Dean, Dean obviously I need to send you a, an autograph picture of myself yes can and that was with Fish Martin. we did a, a frog show uh, down there at Okeechobee and we murdered him down there and just with, with Roland Martin on that. It was a great day. We, we killed, we caught a bunch of them back then. And then some of the, uh, the, the Bassmaster covers that I had, um, you know, it's kind of ironic. See this one right here. This was back in 1997, even before I started throwing frogs and look at the picture. There's a snag proof frog on there. How about that? Very yeah. cool. These are the things that come. So anyway, right. but, uh, um, your office, I'm sorry. I love your office and your and your tackled storage and everything. It's very, very cool. Those are all my, my blue trophies up there. You can see up there. And then, uh, oh, I got to show you the, the big one, though. That's the one I'm really, really proud of right there. Oh, yeah. That's the tour one. How about that? Beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Yeah, it's awesome. 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 But, uh, no, I got all my fishing line up here, all different weights, different uh, different sizes and Everything packed in there where I, where I need it. And then moving on across here, just uh, my hard baits are up here. My deep diving crank baits, uh, everything I need here, everything's labeled, marked, uh, so I know where to go to get it. And then down here, of course, you can see the pro, the spro stuff down here, my frogs. And then I've got my old school wiggle warts and stuff. And then uh, stuff. But this is only half of it. And down here is my soft plastic stuff that I carry, all the different stuff. But uh, and I've got boxes and my hooks and everything that I get from Gamagatsu. Uh, all my four rocks, all my trouble hooks, single hooks, trailer hooks, everything, reels, and then stuff. So, but uh, yeah, it's, you know, this is my profession. This is what I do. So I, I have to have all the right tools. And I've got great companies that, uh, that support me. And uh, just very, very grateful to have, you know, the gifts that I have in my life and, and to, uh, 
um, be a part of it. I'm just very grateful. Very nice. Absolutely yeah. well earned. Well earned, sir. Yes. And I'm amazed at the organization. I said it. I said it earlier, and uh, and I think it would take me about five doctors and you know a team to be able to get that kind of organization in in my garage. I'm impressed. Any any tips for organization? Like, how, how do you stay on top of it when it's when it's freezing outside and it's cold and, and you got to work on you want to do some fishing stuff? Those I love it, especially here in the desert when it blows like 30 miles an hour in the wintertime. I, I spend all day in here. I, I change trouble hooks. People know me because they've come over and they've helped me. They'll, they'll, they'll take the old ones off and I put new ones on everything. We'll be in here for hours and just listen to the radio and, uh, and just working on fish and tackle, man. Just getting – because it is so important at my level to be at 100% because one lost fish, you know, Pete. Mm -hmm. I mean, one fish can cost you the, the tournament, you know. And if, if, and if I can – Reduce that amount by working eight or 10, 30 hours in here to make sure that I'm a hundred percent out there. I'm going to do that. And, uh, and that's what you know, allowed me to, I, I like to think that way is because of the hard work I put during the off season. So when I put a box together, it's a hundred percent. The hooks are all brand new. They're sharp. Everything's ready to go. I tune them in my pool. I got everything right. So when I reached in there during the heat of battle, I know that bait's going to be a hundred percent. And, and that's the way you have to approach it because these guys are so good and they all do it. Most of them do it anyways. They do exactly what I do. So you have to, it's just a high level um, that, you, you know, to stay at this, this level of fishing because these are great, man. I mean, they just, they, they catch them, you know? So, well, so, so do you. And it's, it's amazing. I'm totally impressed with so, the organization. So my takeaway, Pete, was, was he said, uh, turn off the view and Sally, Jesse, Raphael. Uh, on, on Tuesday mornings and go out in the garage and work on something. And it's, too, it's too big a ask, BTC. Can't do it. But, uh, <laughs> Jake, we have professional fish head in the house, and I see all that tackle. I, I, you know, I don't know what his questions are going to be, but, Dean, if it's okay with you, we're going to have him hit you with some rapid-fire questions. Okay, cool. Yeah, so uh, – you know, this, this this is the frog days of summer, right? So, guys, if you're if you're not subscribed, two free pro frogs, our brand new camo hat that BTC is uh, sporting right now for joining annually. Come on over and, and sign up. But that's what we're doing. I mean, this is this is like a month long deal. We go all in on frog fishing. We bring you the best. We got the best talk right now. And and Dean, we're we're talking about pro frogs. You know, they've got. 41 different colors in the bronze eye frog 65 that is more cut that's a better color sec selection you know than than any of the frogs out there that you can go on on tackle warehouse that's why it's the number one seller on tackle warehouse now my questions are all going to be about frog fishing in the summertime and i'm gonna i'm gonna say a line a situation and I want you to hit me back really quick with your best color or colors right away for these situations. You ready? All right, you're down in Florida, so tannic water, lily pads. Natural green. Ian hates right. lily pads, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> it's natural my green. I don't I don't push a lot of pads around with frogs. I don't uh, I know. People, that's you think it's like peanut butter and jelly. Well, sometimes it's not. It's it's it it it's uh it's like looking at all those timber in the lakes. You know, when you the flooded lake, you got all that timber out there. That's what I see when I see lily pads. I just see a, a mess out there, and you know, too many places for fish to hide. Peanut butter yeah. and sand. Sorry to interrupt, <laughs> question. Sorry about that. No, you're good. You're good. I, I like it. I mean, as I well know, is you know, Dean is has fished a frog differently, and we we know. I I just had to ask a few of the grass stuff, but here we are. You're in the southeast. You're at one of the mixed lakes where there's spotted bass and largemouth bass, and uh, so now you're you're going up some creeks. What color are you reaching for? Uh, black. Black. Midnight. Midnight Walker. Midnight Black. Right. Okay. Uh, uh, black. Now I'm taking you up north this summer. All right. It's a. It's the predominant smallmouth fisheries the the big ones you know but i'm sending you to the bank with kermit what what color frog brown natural red color mm. 
Shad Spawn. Nasty Shad. Nasty Shad. Clearwater Brim Beds. IU. 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 That's a throw off. IU. Come back to the left a little bit again. There we go. Hey, IU there. Up. There it is. There there you go. Go. Purple on the, on the side, green on top. Love it. it. That is like a secret, man. That's a great frog or color right there. Not no more. <laughs> <laughs> That's what this is built for. So Lake Havasu, your backyard, you're around the Thule's, and let's just say they're eating baby blackbirds for fun. Oh, midnight walker all the time. Jet black. It doesn't matter if it's if it's sunny, cloudy, hot, cold. It don't matter. I throw the black one. The black one's money. Matching the hatch more more important than anything else sometimes. Mm -hmm. Okay, speak of, of of the hatch. How about a mayfly hatch, Dean? Natural red again. I go with brown or even like the outback color. Ooh. Okay. On the on the on the, the back, little green on top. Flip it over, a little bit of yellow there, a little bit of brown, a little bit of white. Nice. The Outback, that's a, a great color, man. Doing a lot of damage on that dude right there. I'm, I'm going to have to get me a few of those this summer. All right, let's entertain the cheese crowd again. Lake Gunnersville, smack dab in those those cheesy mats. Well, Freak, the color Freak, I don't. I have it hanging there. Uh, here, let me grab it. Right there, Dean, I got you. about that yeah i'm all over it <laughs> Drink That's, on top of it you know why because oh you have it don't you I see it okay that's the one right there buddy you yeah know it's a long ways away that's why we paint the nose uh that bright like that yeah oh, i man. love that idea man that's why i love it but it's you know oh yeah i know all right <laughs> just straight up muddy water dean wherever you're at it's muddy midnight water Mm. Yeah, black. guys midnight walker is about to sell out um the wackiest looking color that you have caught absolute giants on it's got to be one of those wacky colors barney 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 you seen barney purple yeah i, yeah. I have i believe brian oh. had barney uh, on his on water video on bashu tv on on skipping frogs around docks oh. Uh, here we go. Hit subscribers. Look at that. There it is. Wow, that's purple. Tell us, Dean, where, what are you? What are you doing? Where are you throwing that one when when you get catching them on that? Well, it's when there's uh, a bluegill type thing. Same thing, you know. With uh, uh, IU, it all depends on the water color. This is more like a like a dirtier water, stained water type deal. The IU works great in the clear water because of the, the clear spark. You know, really, it's a top of shine. But that dude right there, man, Barney, the red eyes. That, that's, that dude, it's, it's one of those things that nobody ever talks about, you know, because it's, it's, it's round. All the natural colors you want. All right, Dean, it's just you and me. I've got everybody else on mute. They can't hear what we're saying. You and I have been friends a long time. How, how important is the color on top of the frog, really? Well, uh, you have to be able to have a product that's going to grab – your customer. And so if, if the bait on the top looks good and it's uh, for somebody who uh, is on the fence about buying one, they'll push them over the edge, knowing that the bait is going to work either way because you know it's designed to do that. Uh, but we've made them feel good because it, it's a, the frog, the bait, and the color is appealing to them. So in, a, in their mind, they're picturing themselves catching a fish on it. And so that triggers a positive response. And, and when they do, then it's, it's over with. Then, then we have them and we can continue to, you know, do what we do and build great baits and they can catch a lot of fish. You know, that's the whole idea. That's awesome. BTC, you can let everybody else hear now. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Dean, I'm, I'm amazed at, at your diversity in color selection. Because, you know, you see it so often. A lot of the guys, even at the top, they, they want to keep it as simple as possible. Now, I've heard Midnight a lot. Um, but, but man, you do choose a lot of variety in your colors for your frogs. Yeah, because, you know, we're fishing, we're fishing different parts of the country. And there's different critters and stuff that are 
in the waterways. Um, you know, some of the lakes you go to up north, like where you're at, they freeze. You know, I mean, freeze over. And here in Havasu, you can throw a frog 12 months out of the year. It doesn't, you know, so they're all different. And a lot of our ideas, a lot of our colors come from our customers. And, uh, you know, and that's what we, we have such a real, great relationship with them is they send us colors and uh, they hey, go, hey, man, can you make something like this? Can you make something like that? And, and we listen to our customers. And it's important um, because we want them to be successful. Uh, out there on the water. So if we can build a bait that's going to help them catch more fish, uh, that we're going to go ahead and do that. I mean, that's just how we work. And so with us expanding into different markets throughout the world now, now, you know, uh, the snakehead deal is really big in Asia. So we, uh, the King Daddy is like the big seller out there because they love this. Thing. I mean, absolutely love it. So it's, it's a bait that appeals to different parts of the world as well and in color. So, you know, we're, we're constantly, you know, evolving and changing and adding new colors. Uh, uh, my son, Austin, he is, uh, he, he has two brand new colors. Uh, one of them right now is the best seller. It's called Diamondback. And um, he came up with the name. Uh, he came up with the pattern. I had to finish it off for him, but it was his, his idea. And it, it is an incredible looking bait. Um, and then he's got Piranha, which is the other one that works really well. It has the bottom like a blue deal and the green top. It's beautiful. So, Go on top of warehouse, check them out. Uh, yeah. on I, and the, by the uh, way, Dean's son is such a, a polite and intelligent young man. He's going to be running uh, a major tackle corporation one year if he decides he wants to do that. He loves it. He works at the tackle store here now, and uh, he just got back from the uh, high school championship up there in uh, La Crosse, Wisconsin. They finished up uh, three days ago, right when I was fishing up with the chick. And uh, they did well. They were in 10th after the first day, and they struggled the second day. Uh, we kind of on the third, but it wasn't enough. They, uh, they just got overrun. But, um, you know, he, he loves the fish. He skips a frog just as well as I do, even probably even better at certain times. And it's, it's, a, it's amazing to watch him um, at 18 years old. You know, I, I never – I didn't have any of that when I was that age. I, I was just trying to get a backlash out, you know. I'm just trying to run a, a bait cast, you know, so – and he's skipping and throwing big baits and just, I mean, the whole wing going, the whole deal. It's just, it's really cool to watch him uh, evolve into that. And, and, and if he chooses, I don't know, everybody asks, is he going to do it uh, full time? I don't know. You know, I know what it takes to, to perform at this level. He sees what I have to go through, uh, as we all do, all the pros do. And it's hard. It's hard. You, you sacrifice a lot and you give up a lot. And, uh, and, and I don't know if, if, if that's what, he wants to live his life and that's okay. If he chooses not to do it, it's, it's his life to live. It's, you know, choices that he wants to do. Um, my oldest, he doesn't want him to do it. Fishing. I mean, absolutely nothing, but he's a, he's a flight instructor. And so he flies every day. Wow. He just, he, that's what he does. He loves to fly. And like, and I always told him, I said, chase your dreams. I tell my young ones, I said, you only live once, man, go, don't look back, go chase your dream, you know, and make it a reality. Like I did make it a living fish. Yeah. Hey, Dean, I, I got to ask you, man, you keep bringing it up, just little tidbits. What? And, and the funny thing is, one of the biggest frog fish that I've caught has come on it, but I have not had it in my hands a lot. I'm sure a lot of us haven't. Tell us what to do with that king daddy. Where are we, where are we throwing that? What situations will, will that absolutely shine? Well, it's uh, first off, you have, the right, you have to have the right frame of mind, okay? Uh, <laughs> You're throwing up this thing weighs three quarters, almost three quarters of an ounce. It's a heavy bait, okay? Uh, and plus, when it gets wet, it gets even heavier. So you need a little bit heavier equipment. Uh, I make a seven four action rod, same design as my regular frog rod, but it has a fast tip. But same reel, same line, uh, and you, you this. I mean, it's a big bait, okay? But it, it's so cool, guys, because it sits so high on the water column. There's so much air in here that it rides really high on the water. So you can walk it really good. And um, you just gotta go, hey, you know, if you're a, if you're a frog fishing geek like I am, and you, just, you, know, you want something a little bit different, a little more flavorful, you know, give, give the King Daddy a try. Because when you get an explosion on it, it's awesome, dude. Because you'll have two pounders eat this thing, even one and a half, because they'll eat the whole thing. But the way they hit it, I mean, they, it's, it's different than like, you know, the little bronze eye, you know, walking around, walking through the neighborhood, they just kind of slurping down. Man, they, they give it everything they got when they, when they hit this thing. And uh, 
and it's it's exciting because it's it's gonna be a big fish and it's the coolest thing ever dude it's it's so cool when you throw this thing i don't throw it in competition because um i haven't found the right situation yet um but if you're just fun fishing and you're just like hey man i want to throw the king daddy and you'll see you'll you'll catch big ones man they'll they average four pounds you know and they're big ones and, and yeah. the ones eat a regular bronze eye and they just want a bigger bait and it's just so cool when they, when they unload on it sign me up man you see a little <laughs> squirrel squ swimming across the back of a pocket that's when you're going to pull that out huh yeah yeah. So, well, yeah. I would also. I'm gonna. Uh, I'm gonna throw because we got an exciting part of the show, uh, the Ken Duke trivia question. But be, just real quick before we get there, I want to suggest your future bestseller is going to be an all orange Bass University colored frog with blue highlights. Um, <laughs> just, I just give it, give it give it some thought, guys. It's bro. <laughs> 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 Guys, I, I hate to take over here with a trivia question, but we're having way too much fun. There it is. Whoa, there it is. <laughs> Halloween, man. Rust. That is. Call that, you should call it Pete's Rust. <laughs> no, there, there's that way too that much one might work out on, on the flats with all those goldfish. Yeah, really. Yeah, no <laughs> doubt. Dean, what's the color? What's the name of that color? Oh, Halloween pumpkin. Halloween pumpkin. Uh, oh, very cool. All right, way too much fun going on in the show right now. <laughs> Time for me to put some pressure on the guys here on the show. This is what I call the panel trivia <laughs> question. So bring it. Is BTC, Dean, Pete, JK. You guys are the ones. I, uh, Dean Rojas, I, I, ha I hate to say Dean because I could be talking about Pete Glusick, the dean of Bass University. <laughs> but Dean Rojas, I, I might have to disqualify you from this one. But everybody else is fair game for the moment. Um, here's the question. When Dean broke the bass record for heaviest five bass limit on January 17th, 2001, whose record did he break? Pete Glusick's 15 pound bag. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm going to give Brian bonus points for, for that clever I'm, I'm answer. Take them bonus points. Incorrect. What, what year did it happen again? It was 20 years ago. Well, well almost 20 years ago, JK. Uh, Dean broke the record on January 17th, 2001. Mm. Now, Dean, do you know the answer, Dean? Yeah, and I bet you don't even know the answer, Ken. I bet I do. <laughs> I bet I do. <laughs> you, I, I know you like to stump me, well, but I, I bet I do. Well, Dean, yeah, when, you broke, when, you, when the record was broken, what, what was the previous record? I, I, for some reason, I have the 30s that's, in my head. That, whoa, whoa, whoa. Pete Glusick, I asked the questions here. Yes. <laughs> Can you tell me which man I broke? I know who I know who you're thinking of, but I think that I, I got the symptoms. I'm not thinking of who you're thinking of. I'm thinking of the correct <laughs> answer. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! Some tough talk. Yeah. I know. Oh, it's it's you, and I, you and I have to talk in code. Luckily, we've known each other long enough that we speak in code most of the time. Hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm honest. I, I, I can't make a guess at it. I'm going to need a clue. I have no clue. Buttered All right. Toast. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a clue that's going to show Dean I know the correct answer. <laughs> okay, here it is, Dean. You're going to nod your head because you're going to say, well, Ken actually knows something here. He broke the record. When Dean broke the record, the record was about 20 minutes old. Oh. Uh, I love there's, there's, there's the, the nod. nod. <laughs> there's the nod. That's what I'm looking for. <laughs> Was it That's Kelly Gordon? About 10 no. minutes. Mark no. Davis. But Dean thought I was thinking it was Mark Tyler. Yes. From, you know, from a couple of years earlier mm. when Mark Tyler had 34-7. <laughs> but Winkler, earlier the same day that Dean broke the record, an angler hit the scales with 34-10. And, and I can't believe that Dean had no faith in me to get this right. I'm so, I'm so, I'm hurt. I'm hurt, Dean. Oh, this one. Right, that's, that's awesome. But yes, uh, he is uh, a touring pro. Uh, 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 he's won almost everything uh, on the really tour. All time greats like Mr. I think got it right. I don't know if you heard him, but I think he snuck it in there. I think, I think Pete got it right. Well, Mark I'm, Davis. No. no. Davis weighed in after and didn't break Dean's record because he didn't have, you know, more than 45-2. I, I think Mark had 41 and change. Oh. Substandard. 
But he would have broken the record had he weighed in before. He, that's the thing. Pete, you could have had the lead in that tournament if you weighed in first. <laughs> I wish I had. Uh, uh, all right. I'll give you a, a hint. He's a West Coast angler. Uh, John Murray. Byron Velvet. Nope. Byron Velvet. Nope. <laughs> it wasn't Ish. I know it wasn't Ish. It wasn't Ish. That leaves Skeet and by the way, the record got broken Skeet like five Aaron or six times that Paul day. Bailey. Skeet Reese. What I hear? Who? Get, get, go back. Who are you saying? Skeet Reese. No. Paul Bailey. <laughs> no. Aaron Martin. Yes. Aaron, Aaron, Aaron. Martin. Aaron set the record with 34-10. You know, riding high. Had to feel great about setting an all-time record like that. And then it got uh, stomped. But then... Dean Rojas is, is 20 minutes later, and he's going to break the record by almost 11 pounds. <laughs> That's so rude. <laughs> Should have kept on the gas, boys. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Dean, or what, Ken, what was, what was the record that was broken by Aaron? What was the previous was, uh, record? Yeah, it was Mark Tyler in 1999 on the California okay. Delta. That was the day that Tyler caught a 14-9 and on his very next pitch catches another one eight or nine pounds. So in, in two consecutive pitches, he had like 23, 24 pounds, uh, wow. which is also insane. But, uh, yeah, he Aaron broke the record that had been around for a couple of years before Dean obliterated it. Man, did, did you ever – how many people weighed in over 40 pounds in that tournament? Mark Davis was the only one, and he weighed uh, 42 and change on the second day. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a, a lot of high 30s at that point, uh, but uh, that was the only time that the 40-pound mark was surpassed at that event. We went down to Lake Falcon, and that's where uh, Terry Scroggins weighed in 44-4. He almost beat it down there. Yep. And then Aaron weighed, I think, 41 down there as well, 40 or 41. And those are the only two that went out that surpassed the 40 pound mark. I don't even think uh, Paul Elias came in with 40 pounds one day. I think yeah. 30, high 39. They're all just high 30. Yeah, wow. but, but such an impressive record. Looks like it's going to last forever. I'm rooting for you, Dean. You know, there, there are some iconic numbers in sports. You know, Babe Ruth, 714 career home runs. Wilt Chamberlain scores 100 in a game. Uh, the 72 Dolphins are 17 and 0. And Dean Rojas, 45-2. Those are, those are the iconic numbers. And, hey, for the folks of you who are, are, are BASU members and who just heard that question about, about whose record Dean broke, that was the easy question today, folks. That was the <laughs> easy one. Ooh, here we go. They're going to have to earn this grand prize Talk tonight. <laughs> Turn off Google. It's not going to help you tonight. Go ahead with it, Dean. Well, I, 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 okay. I learned my lesson, Pete. These BASU guys are too sharp. I checked my question on Google before I before I submitted it to uh, Brian and Riz, uh, and and uh, it's 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 a tough one to find even if you got Google. It's on Googleable. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead with it, Ken. All right. Well, oh, you're yeah. ready for that? Yeah. Let's let's. All hear right. It. Okay. I like it. I'm I'm ready. Here here we go. Um, you know, we talked a lot about hollow body frogs today. What was the first? Hollow body frog lure. What was the first? Very first. The very first. It's not the bronze eye, 65. The bronze <laughs> eye, 65, revolutionized the game, but it was not the first hollow body frog. Do, do, does the rat uh, this category, opening. what's that? Does, does the rat category count as a, as a frog? To my knowledge, this is the first hollow bodied uh, soft bait. So it would it would qualify rat, frog, whatever you want to call it. I remember Anne's built the ghost it was a hollow belly, but it wasn't a, a bait, it was just a long, like a cigar shape. Yeah, it was a spook style bait. And and the the big the I the feet the best feature, the number one feature of that bait is wow. you lost every single fish that bit it. I remember <laughs> wow. You serious, Rich? <laughs> I'm serious as can be. No, Riz, nobody got this yet. Uh -uh. 45 I, I seconds. I'm serious as can be. 
<laughs> Ken Duke, I am serious no as can be. You cannot keep our Bash U TV subscribers down, man. You can't keep them down. Matthew that is shocking. D. Eichinger. Oh, Matt Eichinger. In 1895, Hastings patented the first weedless casting frog. Yep. Wow. Here it comes. I'm blown away. I'm absolutely blown away. That the, the Bass U audience, which is the best out there, but I'm blown away that they know this because uh, James T. Hastings uh, started making this frog in 19, and sorry, in 1894, and uh, he got his patent a year later, and he made these frogs for about a decade before selling the patent to another company. But these frogs had rubber molded bodies, and they were hand painted in this green spotted natural leopard look. And uh, they were absolutely hollow body. I, I, I'm hoping that Brian or Riz can show an image. The image is up of this thing because you're going to be blown away. Yep. By by what this thing that that's now 125 years old, what it looked like. Um, and these things are fairly common because he sold a lot of them, and they go for several hundred dollars depending upon condition and if you can find the original uh, white paper box that it was in. That is but, downright uh, impressive. Yeah, That's, how about it? I'm shocked. I'm shocked. So, wow. I mean, did so you have any Ken, idea? Just, that I don't know if it makes, frog was this old. I don't know. No. I don't know if it makes you feel any better, but but Matt Eichinger, as soon as as soon as you know we announced that he won, I said, "Great job, Matt." He said, "I'm a frog junkie. These are the kind <laughs> of things that he looks up." Right on. <laughs> I I believe it. He's got to be a frog junkie <laughs> for uh, real. There are a lot of antique tackle collectors, fairly avid, fairly knowledgeable, who don't know that. And I had to lean on my uh, antique tackle buddies, guys like Bernie Schultz, in the Bassmaster Elite Series, uh, who's one of the most serious collectors in the biz. Very cool. And, uh, you know, if, if we get the picture up there of, of that uh, particular bait, it's, it's Bernie's picture. Uh, he's a very avid frog collector. He's, in fact, Bernie's probably. Uh, if he's not the number one antique frog collector out there, he's he's certainly in the top two or three. Really knows his stuff. This is a cool looking bait. Yeah, it is. Very it's cool. even got the double hooks, Dean. Yep. The double uh, hooks riding up. That's pretty so, amazing. I was thinking I'll say this to anybody out there who thinks they're fishing some new and and wildly different bait, you are wrong. <laughs> I'm getting, I'm getting, I'm getting messages in from our guys on Bashu TV here, and uh, there was actually that Bernie Schultz. Uh, there's a Bernie Schultz article about it on on Bassmaster, so that might have clued a few people in. But but Matt Eichinger to come in that fast, I mean, it was instantaneous. There was no, there was no hesitation. There was no looking it up. He just knew it. <laughs> he knew it. Uh, I'm okay, guys. That. Back to the drawing board. I've got a. I'm going to stump the Bass U crowd yet. <laughs> <laughs> Ken, Ken, we haven't made it a minute yet, and these are tough questions. Well, it's because you have these hundreds and hundreds of thousands of viewers and listeners, Pete. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we have we 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 we're global here. You know what I yeah. mean? This is worldwide. So this is this is not a, a couple of guys sitting on their lazy boy. This is hundreds of thousands of avid bass anglers. I got a I got a trivia question, um, sort of related to what's going on in, in reference to Dean's uh, world record bag that probably will never be broken, as Denny Denny said. Who amongst the Bass U crew here tonight on the show tonight has the biggest bag in an electric only tournament? Which member of this crew here tonight? And Ken Duke just gave it away. No, I'm raising my hand because I, I might know the answer. <laughs> <laughs> are you kidding me? The bad, the electric only tournaments up here in Jersey are one with like six and a half pounds. Yeah. Well, <laughs> oh yeah. You're yeah. not always the case. Yeah. Sometimes it's eight and a half. <laughs> hey, you guys are giving. You I, guys I take are giving myself out of that. I've known Riz, Riz has caught 14, 15 pounds on some of these places. At least I, that I'm aware of. And Ken, you you I well you gave it away. Well, how big a bag, Ken? Ken, what is it? Uh, back in I think it was ninety nine. I had uh, thirty point one in five fish. Holy Whoa. crap! Um, Eight thirty. I, I finished second. How about that? Oh, I didn't win, but I did have big fish and second place. I had a nine and a half, 
and second place. So wow. I'm uh, from where he sits. Dean Rojas can't even see me with thirty point one. <laughs> uh, I'm way behind Dean. But uh, yeah, it was uh, one of the, it was the best tournament day I ever had in my life. Electric only on a, a lake in Georgia called Varner. Hmm. Wow! Start the engines. Charge right your batteries. Down the street right the me, man. So that's, that's right down the street from me, man. There, there was a heyday back in the '90s, and I wasn't able to get out there. Uh, Justin, but, you were uh, just too late, man. I was running a lot of these electric-only tournaments back then. Wow! Before I went to work at BASS, and we'd hit Stone Mountain Lake, Varner, Horton, some others you're aware of. I, man, and Varner was Varner was. Uh, it would take 25 pounds to have a shot. Yeah, I mean, guys, guys. I remember guys going out there and having 40-pound days. Back when the grass was really good, you know, the hydrilla and whatnot, but I never got to enjoy it. Man, Dean, I got to ask you one more question. After the tour you gave us and then thinking through how how I do it, because I don't do this right. And I mean, I'm a frog junkie. I, I owe you a lot of thanks in the past. You, you know, we made it made a few side side bucks on the on the frog. But man, how do you store your frogs? You know, are you are you storing them in containers? Do you keep them brand new in the pack just to keep the legs fresh? You know, what are some of us doing wrong? How, how do you do it, man? Well, uh, that's a great question. Um, I, you know, I use a lot of them. I give them along the way, you know, so I, I rifle through a lot of frogs each year. So uh, the stock that I have usually doesn't stick around very long. Um, okay. but the, and I, and I, I get asked this all the time is how do I – Keep carrying them in the boats uh, from get from the legs, you know, getting sticky or bleeding or whatever they might do. And a lot of it has to do with the, the box you put them into. Some of the petroleum products they use in there may, you know, may re react with the rubber that creates, you know, to break down stuff. And there's things that you can do. A lot of people like you probably mentioned, seen, you know, they like put baby powder in it. Uh, sand is good. I like I like powder sand uh, as well, but. You know, if you're a frog guy, just keeping them aired out, you know, keeping that, that box, you know, to where let it breathe every now and again, let it get some fresh air in there because, you know, there's a lot of paint, a lot of petroleum, a lot of stuff on these baits, you know, that uh, to get them to look the way they are. And they all don't get along, all those, all those uh, chemicals and stuff. So you got to, you know, pay, pay attention to them. Uh, and on some parts, it's like a little cancer. When they'll start to, to gum up, you just cut them off or, or cut those strands out. So it, it stops it, you know, on that sense. But if you're doing that, you're not you're not frogging enough, probably. And uh, they probably need to be thrown out anyways and get some new ones. Uh, <laughs> from that's uh, that's my take on it. Just, uh, you know, take care of them. You know, it's uh, they're, they're great baits. And uh, uh, just, you know, make sure that they, they, can, they can breathe. Dean, the Spro people have told me that a frog lasts about three days, then it needs to be discarded and replaced. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Well, it's uh, you know, a lot, a lot of people they'll they'll uh, you know they'll they'll throw our frog and catch ten or fifteen fish on it, and you know it starts to get soft and wear, and and uh, sometimes you know they'll get a hole in it or two, and they'll want a new one because the lure broke. Well, let me tell you, so I would trade a bait for a bass any day of the week and twice on Sunday if I knew that I could catch a bass on a bait, you know. Uh, for as many baits as Pete, you have in your ass, all you got, yep. you know, you never see water. They'll never see it, you know, because uh, <laughs> all this stuff will never see the water. I was like, give it away. It's, I, you know, I just throw it all. But, you know, for the most part, you know, hey, if I catch a fish on, on a bat, bass on a bait, uh, you know, it's, it's a good trade. Good trade. Well, you've, uh, shout out to Tackle Warehouse. I see him on our Facebook feed and, and, uh, and you have the number one and number two best-selling frogs on the Tackle Warehouse site. Yeah, Tackle Warehouse, they do a great job. They've been a great partner for us and, uh, and with Spro. And they're, they're just uh, – it's amazing to watch what they've done in the last uh, five or six years. Not longer than that, but just uh, how they are the go-to place now to, to buy Tackle. Uh, and they treat their customers great. You know, and that's what it's all about is service. And uh, the free hats, the free T-shirts, the you know, just caring, free shipping, whatever it might be. You know, they—that's the reason why they care. And uh, a lot, a lot of the companies have lost that, and they're able to uh, capitalize on that. They're great people over there, Richard, and all that stuff that they do over there. They're great people, and I'm so happy that they sell a lot of our baits, a lot of our products, all this program. Gone, got some books, and 
you know, Cruz's dates, McClellan's dates, Russ Lane's dates, and my broad. So um, they do a great job over there. We love everybody at Tackle Warehouse. That's great. We love them too. Uh, appreciate you guys. And, uh, and Dean, man, it's awesome to have you on Bash Universe. I want to thank you very much. Uh, my pleasure. For- you know, I know uh, we hadn't been able to work the details out to get you speaking at one of our Bash University seminars. I hope we can get that done sometime soon. I'd love to have you. I know I know our students would love to learn from you in, in the Bash University classroom sometime. Uh, I want to hear about the world record cats, and then that would push me over my time limit and it'd mess everything up. <laughs> <laughs> You'd bump all the all the speakers, J.K. We'd have to move the schedule. We'd eliminate lunch. We don't know what we'd do, but we'd we'd find a way to fit it. And uh, and thanks so much. I appreciate you taking the time. Good luck the rest of the season. And uh, you know we'll be watching. We'll be cheering for you. And I, I really appreciate you hanging out with us tonight, Dean. Thank you, Pete. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, guys. You guys do a great job there. Um, you know, you guys have been around for a long time, and and uh, it's great to be on the show. And, you got Kendra, you got everybody there, and I'm just uh, thank, thanks for the show. And you know, I'm just happy. To, you know, I love frogging, so I don't mind answering the questions and to help people catch more bass. I and mean, that's what it's all about is uh, seeing a top water strike that everybody loves to see and, and to do it uh, on a frog is, is pretty special. So it's uh, it's a cool deal. Thank you for allowing me to talk about frogging on the show. Man, it was fun. So awesome. Thank you very much, Dean. You have a great night. A lot, buddy. Hey, Dean. Take care, Dean. Man, that was uh, that was an amazing um, interview. It was it was hot. Honestly, it was sentimental to to go back through that that forty five pound you know stringer and 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 relive that with them. It's and it like like it's going to live forever, isn't it? I loved your part about the fifteen pounds. I could see a little <laughs> tear in the corner of your eye. <laughs> <laughs> oh man, sometimes you got to get in over your head. It's it's amazing. And, you know, we didn't really talk about that as part of the deal because that leading up to that tur- that uh, that massive 45, pa- it, w- it was the perfect storm. We had a cold front and, and, and I learned a valuable lesson that I've applied in my fishing from then on. But we had a cold front come and sit on Florida. And, and can you know what cold fronts do in Florida? But it's it's also like a light switch to them because it, it sat on that area, the Kissimmee chain for days. And leading up to the tournament, maybe a day or two before, we saw the temperatures rise up into the 80s and and steady, warm for like two days. First day of the tournament, I think, was like the third day of the warm front. Uh, might be off by a day there, but all of a sudden, there was there was no fish on the banks. Like I said, I'm like, Dean, they're not there yet, buddy. I've been looking. Mm-hmm. And uh, and mm-hmm. if there was not a single fish on the in the shallows. And then on tournament day, it's like every single 10 pounder in the lake crashed the banks and, and Dean just figured out exactly where he needed to be. It was amazing. You know, uh, I remember Dean, I've heard Dean tell the story several times through the years and, and he does talk about noticing those fish moving up in the final day of practice and so forth. But you know, what we're talking about here, Pete, and you're talking about about the the warm weather coming in and the cold front getting pushed out and so forth. That reminds me of, of this thing I've always thought about bass tournaments. You know, the fishing gets bad a lot faster ordinarily than the fishing gets good. You know, it's much more common for guys to whack them one day and then fall flat versus to have a really tough day and then be great because it takes longer for the mm-hmm. fishing to, to, to heat up and, and get cooking and get going. Uh, and it takes – especially in Florida, it just takes one cold front to absolutely wipe out good fishing. Uh, but that was one of those unique situations where, where, as you said, the perfect storm happens, all the records are gone, um, just complete and total devastation out there. It was fantastic. And it was a little – It was we almost had a similar situation a few years later at the uh, 2006 Bassmaster Classic on the Kissimmee chain – where on the first day, all the classic records got blown out. and uh, But then a cold front came through that afternoon and, and really shut things down. So we didn't quite get that perfect storm. But if, if the weather had just stayed good for, for three days of that event, we could have seen some more records broken. Yeah, Flo- Florida, Florida is so temperamental that way, and, and I've seen it so many times. I've, I've been on uh, the winning pattern a couple times in Florida. What I felt – 
would have been a contender. And um, and just the wind changes direction, the north wind blows, and and all bets are off. And uh, and it happens everywhere. It happens everywhere we go. But it was really amazing to see things develop. Now, Ken, I'm going to ask you this because I think it's interesting. The the lakes that we have in the country right now, uh, you know, with catch and release, with the 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 clean water acts that that are you know we're being good stewards of the environment. Things are improving. We're seeing bigger and bigger catches in a lot of different lakes. Is this record ever going to get broken? Well, wow that that question kind of puts into play a lot of things that that we don't ordinarily talk about with records like that. One one of the questions is, well, how long is the five bass limit going to be relevant? Um, mm. what does the major league fishing and BPT format do to the five bass limit here? You've got 80 of the best guys in the business who don't even think in terms of five bass limits anymore. So, uh, when you have a situation like that, you got to say, well, that makes it less likely that it'll be broken because one of the major tours doesn't even use the five bass limit, Good but point. you know, you just got to go back to your, your perfect storm scenario. Again, it could certainly happen on a place like Falcon, a place like clear Lake, maybe the California Delta, another trip to Toho, uh, possibly the St. John's river, but you got to hit it just right. You really do. And, and, and the other part of this is, is money. You know, you look at what tourism groups are spending the money on bringing these tournaments. I mean, your tour- tournament organizations aren't really going out of pocket to go to, the best fish factories in the country. I mean, there's some of them where it just collides, where some of them have tourism groups spending the money, but man, you know, you might miss totally miss a three year window on a, on a lake where these guys could go catch 40, 45 pound bags, but it's not going to happen. You know, they're just not going to go there. Look at Falcon, you know, uh, Bass really hasn't been back to Falcon since 2008. There was, I think there was some bad blood and some issues there. Uh, but you know, they didn't go back. They've been to, to Del Rio to Amistad, but not Falcon where, where Dean's greatest threat came Terry Scroggins on that final day with 44, four and numerous catches over 35 pounds. Um, but when you don't go back there and then of course, the other thing that happens, Pete, and you know this so well, uh, a, a big tournament organization goes into a place like Falcon or the Kissimmee chain and just whacks them. Well, Mm-hmm. Now every every avid bass angler in the country wants to go there and experience that same kind of thing, and and that makes it tougher to repeat that magic, and so that by the time by the time the pros roll back around, you know the fishery is not the fish aren't quite as stupid as they used to be. Yeah, that, yeah. that and them hedonistic meat eaters, some guys eating bass. You know, yeah, Brian, I, you're right. There are some guys who eat bass, but. But every biologist I talk to in the country tells me that we are not eating enough fish. Um, They're not talking about our diets either. They're talking about how catch and release has kind of gone too far, perhaps. Um, We need to call the herd a little. Yeah, need to call the herd a little bit. Interesting. Well, well, that I mean, that's all. That that, that's all nuanced by what exact body of water you're talking about. Yes, it is. You're right. Sure as shit, don't need to call no herd in, in New Jersey. (laughs) <laughs> but matter of fact if they got too many we'll take them the stocking program yes please. Right here, you're absolutely right it's specific to the fishery uh-huh. and, and back to that record you know something that probably nobody really talks about unless you get aaron martins in a room with a couple of guys like us talking is aaron was probably set up you know terry came close in that tournament but aaron was dialed in and what happens on the first morning of the tournament he rolls up, Byron Velvick sitting there, and they share that spot that he's caught 41 and change off of or something, right? Yes, sir. And he yes. sp- that spot. So he gets that all to himself. There's no telling what would have happened because Byron caught him too. Byron caught him too, yeah. And and Paul Elias kind of came out of the pack a little bit on that final day. Yeah, I don't yeah. think I don't think anybody was really looking for Paul to win that tournament but he had a monster day four. Aaron was sharing his water. Uh, Scroggins has a monster day four. It, it, it turned out a little bit different uh, than a lot of people were expecting. To your point, Justin, you're absolutely right. Um, and, and isn't that interesting about how tournaments work sometimes, especially the 
yeah. the barn burner knock down drag out whack fest like that. and you yeah. know what and it makes dean's uh, accomplishment all that more impressive because exactly. he did it with twice the field that yeah. guys are competing in right now well you're absolutely right yeah that that makes a, a world of difference of course and because you got to have a fishery that's going to going to spread the field out. You can't have a place that fishes small. Right. And those lakes were small. It, it, it was amazing. It was amazing. Amazing to hear. It was good. Great to see the pictures. Uh, it's been a great show. Riz, I know we're giving away a monster uh, million dollar prize pack to the like and share people over at Facebook. Uh, it, I don't know if that's the actual number, but it's up there. Uh, have you picked a winner for us? Riz? I sure did. And the, um, the, the Facebook like and share pack is actually only uh it's somewhere between the number of five and twenty one thousand dollars um the <laughs> the bash you ken duke trivia prize pete was actually between the numbers of twenty five and forty eight thousand dollars so um Ooh. so that's why it pays to be a bash you tv subscriber but we're still gonna hook somebody up over on facebook um and the winner of tonight's facebook like and share is Tyler Nolan. Congratulations, Tyler Nolan. You won yourself Tyler. you won yourself a Minn Kota hat, a Tackle Warehouse hat, and a Bash University official hat and t-shirt. Outstanding. Thank you for watching over there on Facebook. I want to give a few shout outs and I want to ask you guys if you have an update uh because I haven't heard one, but I want to I know we've mentioned Aaron a few times and I know he's battling some difficult uh situation and and I'm thinking about him. He's, he's recovering. He's going through treatments. Has, do, do you, are you guys have an update for Aaron Martins for me? Yeah, he, he rang the bell four or five days ago, took his last treatment. And from what I hear, he will be in Wisconsin competing oh, at the wow. last minute fishing deal oh, here in a, a week or two. So, you know, still praying for Aaron. And we're, we're happy to see that he's back, going to be back to doing what he loves and that he fought through that. No, uh, that 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 is that is an impressive impressive thing. So happy to hear it, Aaron. I know we've been thinking and praying for you here yeah. over here at my house and at the Bash University family, and it's so awesome, so awesome to hear it. Uh, is one of mo our most beloved speakers uh, at Bash University. So, um, no, Ken, what do you got? Yeah, I was going to say not only is Aaron one of the all time great anglers in the history of bass tournaments, but he's one of the all time great people. He's just one of the most. Yep genuine decent people i've ever known in my life and, and I, i've always considered it a great privilege to to know and be a be a friend of aaron so yeah we're we're thinking about you we're praying for you we're rooting for you and uh we're we're thrilled that that things are going well a absolutely we are and uh and we also mentioned bernie schultz tonight who gave, gave us a great interview about the original uh, rapala floating minnow that's okay. available over on bash U tv and he's a bash university tv instructor for for many years and uh it was great to hear him come into the conversation as well as a shout out to pat renwick and stray cast for uh checking in and hanging out with us for a little bit tonight and of course, the people over at Tackle Warehouse and TH Marine and Minn Kota and Cash and Rods and all the great people that uh, that help us over here at Bash University. Brian, do we have anything yeah, left on our? Yes. Yeah, Rich and I got a shout out to uh, uh, a, a friend of the show and, and a Bash U subscriber, David Prince. Dave makes his own, pours his own swim baits. And back on March the 4th, he mailed a package out here to New Jersey for Rich and I that ended up in the. Uh, in the Iconelli Fortress Vortex, uh, our man Don <laughs> Slimmer was sitting on it like like a dragon sitting on a on a you know a hoard of gold. And today we finally got our box of swim baits from from David Prince on Instagram. He's Prince Custom Lures. Here's some five inch uh, solid body here. It's a nice hollow body. Real cool swim baits. Thank you, David. Thanks for sending them to us. Appreciate you. Yeah. I'm going to put this to work. Yeah. I'm going to put this to work. I got a club tournament coming up at DOD Ponds. That's a deep clear water fishery. Ooh. And uh one of the one of the swim baits he sent he sent us was a 3-inch minnow swim bait and this thing is super super soft. I can't wait to put it on a 3/8 ounce ball head and shake wiggle and drop this thing across the bottom and catch uh five <laughs> 1 pounders. That's right. And, uh, we actually have we actually have some new stuff coming down the pipe for Bash U TV. Um, and I just want to let everybody know what we have going on. We actually have two swim jig pieces dropping. We dug deep, deep, 
deep in the vaults of the Bash University, and we are remastering and re-releasing Pete Gluzak and Mike Iaconelli on swim jig fishing. Swim jig fishing is a dominant technique in the post-spawn. It's a great summertime pattern. So we are re-releasing one of the best-reviewed seminars that we ever had on Bash University TV with Pete Gluzak and Mike Iaconelli. Also, we are following that up with a swim jig piece from none other than Scott Canterbury. Scott Canterbury delivered an excellent seminar this past year um, in Gadsden, Alabama. That's coming down the pipe. We have a couple of interviews uh, coming with Christine Fisher. Oh, yeah. uh, we interviewed her at the Classic. She is a dominant female angler on the kayak fishing trail. Absolutely great listen. She's a, she's a pleasure to be around, and she's a great interview coming up. And also, we have Freddie Rumbanis, Soft Body Swim Baits. So I am going to listen to Freddie Rumbanis' Soft Body Swim Bait, and then I'm going to rig up my David Prince Swim Bait and go out and catch him. Outstanding. A lot of great stuff coming. We're also uh, filming. We're actively uh, filming. We filmed today. Uh, Riz was there, and uh, we had some uh, some great fish catching action. And tomorrow we'll be out filming with Mike Iaconelli. Uh, doing some more on-water training for you guys. And a lot more to come at Bash University TV, and we will keep you posted here. And you can check it out over at BashU.TV. As well as, uh, we're getting we're getting real close, guys. The Bash University app is now, it is available on the Google Play Store right now. And uh, it is free, so go download it, check it out. And it's going to be coming to iOS, Apple real soon. And we'll keep you posted on all that stuff, making a major announcement. And uh, we'll be releasing that real soon. So that's what's hot at Bass University TV. I want to thank everybody for watching. I want to thank the panel, the, the great keeper of the scrolls, Ken Duke, professional fish head, JK. Appreciate you guys hanging out with us tonight. It's been great. BTC and the Riz, as always, appreciate you. Uh, getting us all getting us off on time tonight. Boy, this is getting yeah. to be consistent. That's all Brian, man. He's getting good. He's getting dialed. <laughs> hey, six years in, baby. And we got on time. <laughs> man, we, we nailed it. We nailed it. And um, I look forward to seeing all of you real soon. And I hope every thank everybody for watching. Really appreciate you guys. And we will see more of you over on Bash University TV Live. We'll see you next Tuesday at 7 o'clock. Thanks, everybody, for watching. And have a great evening. It's Mike Iaconelli. This is Bash U TV. Here's what's awesome about Bash U TV. You get the top instructors. You will learn things at Bash U that you will learn nowhere else. And we help you build confidence with new techniques. We take the mystery and the myths out of bass fishing. Real tools that help you catch more fish consistently. At Bass U TV, shoes are optional. And I like turtles. We teach you to enjoy bass fishing. And that's why you want to check out Bass U TV. Join the Bass U family. Welcome to Bass U TV.